I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHOS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about foreign policy on the show today. And this is in light of the recent horrific tragedy that occurred in Paris over the weekend, uh, where gunmen shot and killed upwards of 140 or so innocent people who had nothing to do with the conflict in the Middle East except that their government was intervening. And I want to point out that this is a symptom of the overall violence that has been occurring in the Middle East for quite some time. And, you know, lots of innocent people are blown up there by the U.S. and by France's government and by other governments who are intervening in the Middle East. And uh, people don't necessarily apply this same innocent people getting killed, oh, that's a travesty, when they're inside of particular nation's borders. So in Syria uh, and Iraq and all of the places that the U.S. has invaded, there has been lots of innocent people who have been killed by the advancing troops, by the bombs, by all of the uh, collateral damage, as they call it. And yet not too many uh, tears have been shed for all, all of the innocent life that has been snuffed out by these interventions. And yet when that violence comes back to Paris and uh, p- innocent people are killed, and, and these innocent people have families, they have friends, they have loved ones who care about them, this is always a travesty. But it is no less a travesty when it occurs in Paris than it is when it occurs in Syria and Iran and Iraq and all of the other places around the world. And so I'm going to turn first to Eric Margolis, who's going to tell us a little bit about what happened in Paris and some of the overall implications of what's been going on around the world and how it relates kind of to this immense tragedy. Homicidal Madness on Friday the 13th. On Friday the 13th, Paris, the city of light, was plunged into darkness and fear. At least eight young jihadists, allegedly from the so-called Islamic State group, attacked the National Sports Stadium, where President Francois Hollande was attending a soccer match with Germany's foreign minister. They also attacked outdoor cafes, a pizzeria, and a rock club. As of this writing, 127 civilians were killed and dozens wounded. All of the attackers are believed to have died. For the second time this year, Paris is terror-struck and shaken to its foundation. Pope Francis aptly described the attacks as, quote, homicidal madness. What was Islamic State's objective in attacking all these improbable, soft targets? Madness is not a sufficient motive. Clearly, Islamic State's 20-somethings were bombing and shooting up targets that youngsters frequented, like a pizzeria or Friday night heavy metal concert. Their objective, to kill as many people as possible in a pure revenge attack. Islamic State, a collection of young hooligans, misguided idealists, and bitter riffraff, have warned the West, quote, We will make you feel what we have felt. They adopted this slogan from the Chechen independence fighters who resorted to attacks on Russian civilians after Russian forces killed an estimated 100,000 of their people in the 1990s. Now it's Europe's turn to feel some of the horrors of the wars in the Mideast. France is a prime target because of its extensive and deepening military interventions in the Muslim world. Some 10,000 French soldiers or airmen and large numbers of intelligence operatives are involved in Syria, Iraq, the Gulf, Libya, Chad, Mali, and Ivory Coast. France props up the authoritarian rulers of Algeria and Morocco. France is playing a central role in its former colonies, Syria and Lebanon. Paris appears to have long-range plans for expanding its influence in the Levant, including installing regimes attuned to French policies. French warplanes are bombing Syria, and this writer believes French special forces have been in combat in Syria, as they were in Libya when the Western powers combined to overthrow the Gaddafi government. <laughs> 
In short, France has made many enemies for itself across the Mideast. It appears only a matter of time before France's partners in Mideast intervention, the United States and Britain, become new targets of jihadist violence. As the Bible says, there is nothing new under the sun. What the 20-something jihadists of IS are trying to do is replicate the terror caused by the fabled 12th century AD sheikh al-Jabal. Operating from his area of Alamut, high in Syria's mountains, the sheikh dispatched teams of hashish-crazed assassins with poison daggers to intimidate all of the Mideast rulers, Muslim and Crusader alike. The murderist Ismali cult soon became known as Hashishan, or assassins, the origin of our term. The, uh, the assassins terrorized the entire Mideast, shaking down its rulers for great amounts of gold. One never knew when or where they would strike. Their first warnings were often pinned to the pillows of intended targets, as happened to the famed Saladin. The assassin teams would strike with poison daggers and then die under torture, laughing and calling out to God. Finally, the great Egyptian Mamluk, Sultan Baibars, and the invading Mongols put paid to the assassins. The survivors fled east and today peacefully live in Pakistan's Hunza Valley under the Aga Khan. The modern reincarnation of the assassins struck Paris on Friday night. Alarmingly, one or more may have entered Europe as a Syrian refugee. Rightists in Europe are already calling for internment camps for Muslims, though they had nothing whatsoever to do with ISIS's teenage lunatics. In fact, IS has put Muslims everywhere in peril, as well as besmirching the name of Islam. Europe may seize the Paris attacks as an excuse to bar any further refugees. That article is by Eric Margolis. It was called Homicidal Madness on Friday the 13th, and you can find it online at lewrockwell.com. Now, what to me is so incredibly frustrating about these attacks and what I think Eric pointed out in his article is that they are revenge. They were part of the larger whole of violence that has been occurring in the Middle East for such a long time. I mean, we have the wars of the U.S. going back about 14 years, intervening in Iraq and uh, Kuwait and all of those situations. But even longer than that, the CIA, when they first were initialized, one of their first duties was to overthrow the elected leader of Iran and put this guy called the Shah into power. And he was a tyrannical leader, and eventually Iran deposed him, but it took them, you know, tens of years or so. And uh, this is a major problem. When governments intervene and they cause all of these wars and they invade and they drop bombs and they do all this stuff to overthrow governments and change the leadership and prop up tyrannical leaders, then what they are doing is creating resentment all around the world for all of their actions. And it just so happens that the Muslims are currently the most enslaved and abused by these foreign and imperialistic powers. But, you know, it should be expected that they're going to fight back when you invade and attack and destroy and all of these things. I mean, the refugees is just a symptom of this as well. The refugees are fleeing from the violence that is being caused by the U.S. state and the other organizations who are bombing and killing and maiming and trying to attack via air and via troops. All these people are running from all that. They hate the violence. They hate the war. And they just want to get away from it. And uh, this is causing all sorts of chaos around Europe. The new refugees coming into the country do not hold the same Western values of uh, private property and do not hurt others. And so they're coming in and they're hurting others and and people are are rushing to the stores in Europe to try and get guns so that they can protect themselves from the immigrants that are coming in at the bequest of the government. And uh, it's, it's just such a mess when you start intervening with physical violence in the society that we live in. You, you have all sorts of catastrophic consequences, and we're just seeing a whole lot of that come to fruit in the world around us.
So the next article I want to read is going to talk a little bit more about this situation over in the Middle East, and uh, it's called The Islamic Caliphate's Holy Warriors Are Increasing Rapidly, and the article's by Jack D. Douglas. James Woosley, former director of the CIA, said in an interview about the Paris attacks that IS has rapidly expanded from about 30,000 to about 150,000. CIA numbers are very dicey and political, but everything indicates that the Islamic Caliphate is growing extremely rapidly at its core, and with new affiliates over thousands of miles in the EU, North Africa, the Middle East, and Afghanistan. This explosive, possibly exponential growth is part of the exponential growth of Muslim holy warriors in general against U.S. and European imperialist attacks of all forms on Islam. This vast explosion of Muslim holy warriors is not surprising. As soon as the U.S. led vast imperialist strangulations, annihilations, invasions, and occupations of the Islamic world, it quickly became apparent that the world's one and a half billion Muslims would have to submit to a new imperialism that would cut out Islam's heart, or they would have to resort to their ancient forms of holy war to stop this imperialism. When the U.S. annihilated the infrastructures of Iraq and Afghanistan, invaded these ancient nations and occupied them, it was perfectly obvious that the holy warriors would explode across the vast Muslim world to save Islam from the hated invaders. I and my friends and colleagues wrote about all of this over and over, but it was almost all rejected by the vast majority of people in the West, who are totally ignorant about the rest of the world, not just the Islamic world. There are now hundreds, maybe thousands, of holy warrior organizations from family and village levels, to the nearly global levels of Al-Qaeda and IS. They keep exploding in all ways. Americans and Europeans generally have no idea of how fierce and lasting this Muslim hatred has become of the infidels trying to destroy their world, which is exactly how they see it. The great threat of IS to the U.S. and European empire is not the rapidly expanding attacks on civilians in airplanes and the streets of Paris and beyond. Those are media recruitment drives by IS and other holy warriors. They are intended to show that hundreds of millions of young Muslim men and women can rise up and save themselves eventually from the hated infidels killing and maiming them by the millions and destroying their ways of making a living for their families. Many millions of Muslims are already totally convinced the empire will not let them live in peace to have families and decent lives. Soon it will be hundreds of millions and continue until the imperialists stop their mass murders and mutilations and economic strangulations. At some point, the people of the imperialist nations, who are also victims of the imperialists, will rise up and stop the insane attacks on Islam. The Muslims did not start these attacks of the past few centuries, certainly not those of the U.S., they immensely prefer peace, but the West is giving them no choice at this point. Christianity has largely died out in Europe, though not in Russia, and is dying fast in the U.S. among most of the people. Islam is still a fervent faith that is growing very rapidly. The secular non-believers of the West do not understand this vast difference. The West and Saudi Arabia use mercenaries to fight the holy warriors. The holy warriors will win, for obvious reasons. That article was by Jack D. Douglas. It's called, The Islamic Caliphate Holy Warriors Are Increasing Rapidly. And again, that's all to be expected. When the imperialist nations go around the world trying to be the policemen, trying to impose their will on these other places, there is going to be resentment and hatred for those invading and um, usurping nations. I mean, all, all we really have to do is have a little bit of empathy and put ourselves in those people's positions to really understand why they're so angry about this. So imagine that some other nation, let's just uh, say China or Iran or whoever, 
comes in here and they start building military bases and they start deposing our leaders and putting whoever they want into power. And then they start uh, bombing people, bombing places all over the place and murdering all sorts of innocent people. I mean, how would you feel? I certainly wouldn't feel great. And again, this is what these people are going through. And there's a reason for what they're doing. It's not just out of the blue. It's not just that they hate us for our freedoms or any of that stuff. And, you know, Ron Paul has been talking about this for a very long time. He called it blowback. And when you intervene violently into other people's lives, eventually that's going to have some sort of repercussion to the initiator of violence. So we're going to use the rest of our half hour to really talk about what the benefit of all of these wars has been. So all the neocons and Republicans say, well, we have to go, we have to protect people, we have to save people, we have to defend people. Well, I mean, that hasn't really worked out very well, right? Because we just had the Paris attacks, we've had plenty of terror attacks in Europe overall, we had 9-11, we had all of these uh, catastrophes that occurred, and guess what? The government didn't protect us from those things. Things. Now, some people would say, well, it would be worse if the government didn't uh, do all of the things that it did. Maybe the attacks would be even worse than they did. I don't buy that at all because, again, looking back, we see that the intervention leads to blowback, it leads to repercussions. But, I mean, what economically has all of these wars uh, benefited us to engage in? And uh, Tom Dispatch has an excellent article kind of diagnosing how much money has been spent on the wars and what really uh, has been gained through all of this. And, and it shows all of the corruption that occurs when all these military companies go bidding for the government to try and get as much money as they possibly can to make uh, pretty garbage products overall. Because, again, it's not, it's not meeting a consumer demand. There's no market here. There's no consumer saying, I would prefer to buy your product as opposed to any other product that I can find on the market. When the government is the one supplying the money, people don't have any choice. And I think this article really outlines that very well. So um, this article is called, It's a Scam! The American Way of War in the 21st Century. Let's begin with the $12 billion in shrink-wrapped $100 bills, Iraqi oil money held in the U.S. The Bush administration began flying it into Baghdad on C-130s soon after U.S. troops entered that city in April 2003. Essentially dumped into the void that had once been the Iraqi state, at least 1.2 to 1.6 billion of it was stolen and ended up years later in a mysterious bunker in Lebanon. And that's just what happened as the starting gun went off. It's never ended. In 2011, the final report of the congressionally mandated Commission on Wartime Contracting estimated that somewhere between $31 billion and $60 billion in taxpayer dollars had been lost to fraud and waste in the American, quote, reconstruction of Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq, for instance, there was that $75 million police academy, initially hailed as, quote, crucial to U.S. efforts to prepare Iraqis to take control of the country's security. It was, however, so poorly constructed that it proved a health hazard. In 2006, quote, feces and urine rained from the ceilings in the student barracks. And that was only the beginning of the problems. When the bad press started, Parsons Corporation, the private contractor that built it, agreed to fix it for nothing more than the princely sum already paid. A year later, a New York Times reporter visited and found that, quote, the ceilings are still stained with excrement, parts of the structure are crumbling, and sections of the building are unusable because the toilets are filthy and non-functioning. This seems to have been par for the course. Typically enough, the Khan Bani Saad Correctional Facility, a $40 million prison Parsons also contracted to build, was never even finished. And these were hardly isolated cases or problems specific to Iraq. Consider, for instance, those police stations in Afghanistan believed to be crucial to standing up a new security force in that country. Despite the money poured into them in endless cost overruns, many were either never completed or never built, leaving new Afghan police recruits camping out. And the police were hardly alone. 
Take the $3.4 million unfinished teacher training course in Shurbaran, Afghanistan, that an Iraqi co company was contracted to build using, of course, American dollars, and from which it walked away, money in hand. And why stick to buildings when there were those Iraqi roads to nowhere paid for by American dollars? At least one of them did at least prove useful to insurgent groups moving their guerrillas around, like the $37 million bridge the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built between Afghanistan and Tajikistan that helped facilitate the region's booming drug trade in opium and heroin. In Afghanistan, Highway 1 became capital Kabul, and the southern city of Kandahar, unofficially dubbed the Highway to Nowhere, was so poorly constructed that it began crumbling after the first Afghan winter. And don't think this was an aberration. The U.S. Agency for International Development hired an American nonprofit, International Relief and Development, to oversee an ambitious road building program meant to gain the support of the local villagers. Almost $300 million later, it could point to, quote, less than 100 miles of gravel road completed. Each mile of road had, by then, cost U.S. taxpayers $2.8 million instead of the expected $290,000, while a quarter of the road building funds reportedly went directly to IRD for administrative and staff costs. Needless to say, as the road program failed, USAID hired IRD to oversee other non-transportation projects. In these years, the cost of reconstruction never stopped growing. In 2011, McClatchy News reported that, quote, U.S. government funding for at least 15 large-scale programs and projects grew from just over $1 billion to nearly $3 billion, despite the government's questions about their effectiveness or cost. So much construction and reconstruction and so many failures. There was the chicken processing plant built in Iraq for $2.58 million that, except in a few Potepkin village-like moments, never plucked a chicken and sent it to market. There was the sparkling new 64,000-square-foot state-of-the-art $25 million headquarters for the U.S. military in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, that doubled in cost as it was being built and that three generals tried to stop. They were overruled because Congress had already allotted the money for it, so why not spend it, even though it would never be used? And don't forget the $20 million that went into constructing roads and utilities for the base that was to hold it, or the $8.4 billion that went into Afghan opium poppy suppression and anti-drug programs and resulted in bumper poppy crops and record opium yields, or the aid funds that somehow made their way directly into the hands of the Taliban. There were billions of dollars in aid that no one could account for, and a significant percentage of the 465,000 small arms, which are rifles, machine guns, grenade launchers, and things like that, that the U.S. shipped to Afghanistan simply lost track of. Most recently, there was the Task Force for Business Stability Operations, an $800 million Pentagon project to help jumpstart the Afghan economy. It was shut down only six months ago, and yet, in response to requests from the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, the Pentagon swears that there are no Defense Department personnel who can answer questions about what the task force did with its money. As ProPublica's Megan McCloskey writes, quote, The Pentagon's claims are particularly surprising since Joseph Catalino, the former acting director of the task force who was with the program for two years, is still employed by the Pentagon as senior advisor for special operations and combating terrorism. Still, from that pile of unaccountable taxpayer dollars, one nearly $43 million chunk did prove traceable to a single project, the building of a compressed natural gas station. Of course, the cost of constructing a similar gas station in neighboring Pakistan was $300,000. Located in an area that seems to have had no infrastructure for delivering natural gas and no cars converted for the use of such fuel, it represented the only example on record in those years of a gas station to nowhere. <laughs>
All of this just scratches the surface when it comes to the piles of money that were poured into an increasingly privatized version of the American way of war, and in the form of overcharges and abuses of every sort often simply disappeared into the pockets of the warrior corporations that entered America's war zones. In a sense, a surprising amount of the money that the Pentagon and U.S. civilian agencies invested in Iraq and Afghanistan never left the United States since it went directly into the coffers of those companies. Clearly, Washington had gone to war like a drunk on a bender while the domestic infrastructure began to fray. At $109 billion by 2014, the American Reconstruction Program in Afghanistan was already, in today's dollars, larger than the Marshall Plan, which helped put all of devastated Western Europe back on its feet after World War II, and still the country was a shambles. In Iraq, a mere $60 billion was squandered on the failed rebuilding of the country. Keep in mind that none of this takes into account the staggering billions spent by the Pentagon in both countries to build strings of bases ranging in size from American towns to tiny outposts. There would be 505 of them in Iraq and at least 550 in Afghanistan. Most were, in the end, abandoned, dismantled, or sometimes simply looted. And don't forget the vast quantities of fuel imported into Afghanistan to run the U.S. military machine in those years, some of which was siphoned off by American soldiers to the tune of at least $15 million and sold to local Afghans on the sly. In other words, in the post-9-11 years, reconstruction and war have really been euphemisms for what, in other countries, we would recognize as a massive system of corruption. And let's not forget another kind of reconstruction then underway. In both countries, the U.S. was creating enormous militaries and police forces, essentially from scratch to the tune of at least $25 billion in Iraq and $65 billion in Afghanistan. What's striking about both of these security forces, once constructed, is how similar they turned out to be to those police academies, the unfinished schools, and that natural gas station. It can't be purely coincidental that both of the forces Americans proudly stood up have turned out to be the definition of corrupt. That is, they were filled not just with genuine recruits, but with serried ranks of ghost personnel. In June 2014, after whole divisions of the Iraqi army collapsed and fled before modest numbers of Islamic State militants, abandoning much of their weaponry and equipment, it became clear that they had been significantly smaller in reality than on paper. And no wonder, as the army had enlisted 50,000 ghost soldiers who existed only on paper and whose salaries were lining the pockets of commanders and others. In Afghanistan, the U.S. is still evidently helping to pay for similarly stunning numbers of phantom personnel, though no specific figures are available. In 2009, an estimated that more than 25% of the police force consisted of such ghosts. As John Sopko, the U.S. Inspector General for Afghanistan, warned last June, quote, We are paying a lot of money for ghosts in Afghanistan, whether they are ghost teachers, ghost doctors, or ghost policemen, or ghost soldiers. The article continues to point out uh, more of the corruption and uh, theft, genuine theft that occurs where the government takes money from taxpayers and transfers it to businesses who then never complete their tasks or complete it in such an abhorrent way that it doesn't even work. Um, And that's just the way things go when you hand the money over to the state to fix problems. Uh, Problems never get fixed. The money just disappears, and then they go and demand more money. All the new presidents are saying, we need more money for the military. Well, they didn't really do a great job with the money that they had. So I want to thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, That article is by Tom Dispatch, by the way. You can find it online at tomdispatch.com to read the rest of it and all of the profligate spending that was had by the military over in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that article is called It's a Scam. So I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope that you have a great week. Take care.